I'm Italian Spider-Man, and this is Out of the Trenches, where I stand here in the Dolomite Mountains on my Balcone di Saggezza and answer all your questions about the First World War. Uh, Matush Kole writes, Hi Indy, as an electro-technical engineer, I'm interested in electricity, okay? I would like to ask how it was produced and used on different fronts or trenches. Germans used electric fences in Belgium. Was it also used on front lines? How was the technical background of using electricity on the front line? The Great War had a big impact on the rapid development of different fields of human life, aircraft, medicine. Can we also say that the Great War prompted the development of electricity? Thanks for an excellent show. Um, the Great War was the first major war that made use of new electrical technologies that had only been recently developed. Uh, for example, on battleships where electric power not only turned gun turrets or, or brought ammunition up from the magazines, uh, a lot of essential instruments from signal lamps to indicators and fire alarms were in fact powered by electricity. For staff work on land, well, the most important device was the radio, which could, by the later stages of the war, transmit voice instead of code through oscillators, electron tubes, and amplifiers in the field. Those communication stations were often powered by muscle. You had like those little bicycles with a dynamo that powered the generators. Um, one big use was electricity for searchlights that now every army possessed. High intensity arc lamps were bright enough to spot the enemy or blind attackers and defenders alike. Microphones were used to identify enemy activities, and submarines as well as tanks were partially or even primarily powered by electric transmission engines. But on the actual battlefield, electricity was not that much in use. Um, in the first defensive lines, you had to rely on like little candles for light since the artillery would smash any electric cable connections and you couldn't use much artificial light anyway without risking your night vision, right? Um, also, transporting the big wet cell batteries to the front lines was a big hassle, although there are reports from German officers' dugouts that had electric lamps, among other luxuries. Uh, fun fact, um, there was even an attempt to use electricity as a weapon, right? Like a flamethrower, a stream of electrified water was to be shot into the enemy's trenches. Now that never worked out though, but yes, the Great War accelerated the innovations of electrical engineering. Soon after the war ended, a lot of the technologies would in fact enter civilian use. Uh, Yote asks, Hi Indy, I've been reading a comic set in World War I called Charlie's War. Okay. Uh, in this comic, a German plane once bombarded enemy trenches with steel arrows. Also, a German platoon mounted machine gun, I suppose they mean machine guns, on the backs of their strongest soldiers, using them as mobile tripods during their assault. That last one sounds particularly fictitious, but the author claims both are based on real events. Could you tell us if there is any truth to them, please? Well, I will try to. Um, well, the steel arrows were called flechettes and were mostly used by the French, but also by German aviators during the first years of the war. They were little steel rods about six inches, like 14, 15 centimeters long, and sharpened on one end. The pilot would keep a box of them of around 500 or so, and he would drop them over the enemy. They were viciously effective, right? Dropped from such a height, the steel dart would pierce not only the helmet, but would literally pierce the body from head to toe. The British thought the weapon was too barbaric to use because the soldier would not hear the dropping dart and the inflicted wounds were gruesome. They weren't used much later in the war though, since dropping those darts was very inaccurate and only really inflicted a lot of casualties when the enemy was close together in formation. By the way, there is a theory that the Angel of Mons that came to help the British in the form of ghosts of English longbowmen was actually those darts that killed the Germans en masse. Now, it wouldn't surprise me if there was actually some truth to that. For your second question, yes, it is possible to fire a machine gun from the shoulders of a man, but the German MG-08 weighs like 26 and a half kilos. That's nearly 60 pounds. Now, the MG-08-15 and the 08-18 were lighter, but still, it's not a light machine gun 
to be fired from the shoulders. Um, this was more easily done with, let's say, a Lewis gun, which only weighed half of that. And even then, though, it was very inaccurate and more of an emergency solution. This was a practice that was a bit more common in the Second World War. Uh, ben Pearson asks, the Wright brothers filed a patent in 1902 for their flying machine that was still in effect during World War I. How did this impact the U.S.'s ability to enter the aerial war? I've heard that there were pretty severe discussions as to how to make this work, and the government had to step in to allow planes to be manufactured. But I'm curious what you have to say. What I have to say. Oh, I heard nature. What I have to say. Um, the Wright brothers saw themselves as the pioneers that discovered the secret of manned, powered, heavier-than-air flight, and therefore began a new era of technology for mankind. They also thought that because of all of their hard work and their discoveries, they deserved to be the ones to be credited and financially rewarded. The right patent for the discovery of the controlled turn that allowed the use of the rudder and the wing warping simultaneously, which was essential for controlling the aircraft during flight, was granted in the U.S. in 1906. Now, their lawyer, Henry Tolman, patented the three-axis system, which stabilizes the plane and is still the schemata after which modern airplanes are built. You even use it to control planes when you play video games. You know, the, everybody knows that. Uh, the Wright brothers, though, thought that others would eventually steal their ideas, and they began suing companies in the U.S. and in Europe. That is what is known as the Patent Wars. In France, they had success at first, while in Great Britain, they received some money in compensation. And in Germany, the judges totally dismissed their claim. In the US, however, where the Wright brothers were officially seen as the pioneers in the practical art of flying, their biggest competitor, Curtis, was supported by the power of Henry Ford. Both sides uh, engaged in a years-long negotiation and accusatorial cycle that was not finished when the U.S. joined the war in 1917. Um, the U.S. government, realizing that because of that patent war, they practically had no useful modern airplanes for military use available, put a stop to the judicial nightmare. There is still a lot of debate about who was wrong and who was right. <laughs> right, yeah, okay. Um, about this, but many agree that the Wright Brothers' patent war did severely hamper the development of aircraft technology in the United States. And that's why U.S. pilots had to rely on machines from France and Britain. We'd like to dedicate this episode of Out of the Trenches to Italian Spider-Man. If you've never seen Italian Spider-Man, you should definitely look him up and check him out. If you'd like to see our episode about communications during the First World War, you can click right here for that. Do not forget to subscribe. See you soon.